Okay, everybody, it's time to start the afternoon session. So if you could all come in and take your seats, please. <clears throat> For those of you who are sitting right under a screen, um, there are some seats now at the back of the room. If you'd like to move, you might find it a little bit more comfortable. Okay, let's get going. Try and be on time. Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Okay. Welcome back. Hope you're all feeling refreshed and replenished. And welcome to the first session of the afternoon. So my name's Carol Burks. I'm the CEO with MND Australia. So it's um, with great pleasure that I am chairing this influencing session. Um, influence, as the National Peak Organisation, influencing is very much a part of my role. So I'm really looking forward to this session. So um, our first speakers this afternoon, I think we have a trio. We've got Anna Connolly, um, occupational therapist, Catherine Moy, physiotherapist, Rebecca Lamont, speech pathologist, and they all work as part of a multidisciplinary MND clinic at Northern Health, together with a team that includes neurology, nursing, and respiratory specialists. They provide a coordinated, multidisciplinary approach to the care of people living with MND, and have been working with the NDIS since its rollout in July 2016 across the northeast metropolitan areas. So the title of their talk is Multidiscipline multidisciplinary management of people with motor neurone disease under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Please welcome. Thank you. Um, so there were four of us, but Lucky Chanel is in Spain enjoying some sunshine while we're here in beautiful, rainy Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, so we're going to, as Carol um, mentioned, we're going to talk about multidisciplinary management of people with MND under the NDIS scheme. So just a bit of a background. Um, in Northern Health, in the northern suburbs of Melbourne, we started um, an MND satellite clinic in conjunction with neurology from statewide provider that you've heard from before, Calvary Healthcare Bethlehem, and also the Victorian Respiratory Support Service. The aim was to provide care to people in the northern suburbs of Melbourne who had been diagnosed with MND. Since then, Northern Health Allied Health team has delivered a high quality multidisciplinary care to people with MND in the centre or in the client's home. And since July 2016, we've also provided care to NDIS participants, including some of our clients with MND. In August 2017, Northern Health established an MND clinic run by our own in house neurology after um, Jim Howe was talking about retiring. Again. Um, <laughs> um, and in conjunction, we're doing this with Victorian Respiratory Support Service. The service provides a coordinated care model consisting of medical, nursing, respiratory, lung function tests. Our M&D regional advisors also attend the clinic with the clients and also our allied health team. So our Northern Health catchment is an ever-expanding growth corridor and it also has a very high culturally and linguistically diverse um, population. On average, we receive about 15 new referrals for clients diagnosed with MND per year, but since taking over the clinic, we've noticed an increase in that number, so that might change next year. And the MND clinic makes referrals to OT, speech pathology, physio, dietitian, podiatry, orthotics, continence, nursing. So we're, again, in the north, we're just a bit special in that we see our community team provides services for three different funding services. So that's one team working in three different streams, which can get quite confusing at times. So I'll try and explain it as quickly and simply as possible. In Victoria, we all saw clients under the home and community care services pre 
July 2016. Um, Northern, as I mentioned before, Northern Health was one of the first rollout areas of the NDIS post the trial phase. Um, and it rolled out in 2016 in July. Commonwealth Home Support Program, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware, started in Allied Health in Victoria in October 2017, which I know is a bit later than the rest of Australia. So due to all these changes in funding, there was a group that was identified that didn't meet with the Commonwealth Home Support Program and didn't meet with the NDIS program either. And that's when the government created this sort of subgroup called HAC Program for Younger People. So those, it's for those people who don't have a permanent disability or maybe newly diagnosed and isn't yet to register through NDIS. So there are sort of three streams that we're working with. Um, and for our clients with MND who are under 65, they start with us on the program for younger people and we assist them to transition onto the NDIS. So um, as most of you probably already have heard about the NDIS, um, so the program is designed to, um, to assist participants to live an ordinary life. Um, it's now available in select areas of Victoria and uh, in other Australian states. Um, and we are a provider, an NDIS provider, assisting adults with chronic or progressive neurological conditions. We have an extensive experience in assessment and management of people with complex needs and provide a coordinated multidisciplinary approach to care in trying to sort of meet all these things such as reasonable and necessary supports, um, providing participants the choice and control, being goal-directed um, and being market-based. So our objective. So our objective was com to compare data pre-NDIS rollout and post-NDIS rollout. So that's for two, 24 months pre-NDIS rollout and 24 months um, post-NDIS rollout. And we wanted to see had our care changed, had our experience with this changed. So we pulled reports from our client data management um, programs used by Northern Health comparing phenotype, length of stay, time spent doing joint sessions, home visits, face-to-face -face contact, total activity including direct and indirect time and billable and non-billable hours. Um, and this aim was to, in this purpose was to inform us of future management of NDIS participants and assist with planning with advocacy work. So the Northern Health, Allied Health team, were involved with the care of 75 people with MND between the 1st of July 2014 and the 30th of June 2018. This is the breakdown of the clients who attended our clinic during that time according to phenotype. The largest group of clients had vulvar ALS followed by ALS of unspecified onset. The changing graph here shows the change in the makeup of the Northern Health MND population since the rollout of NDIS on the 1st of July 2016, comparing the percentage of people under the funding models of NDIS versus non-NDIS. And I'm sorry, it was very quick if you missed the, but the range was between 33.33% and 46.66% of the clients in the clinic under NDIS funding at one point in time. So we compared the average time of face-to-face -face therapy provided to all clients across the funding models according to phenotype. This graph demonstrates that the ALS onset unknown group had the most time spent with approximately 17 minutes on average per day uh, for a five-day week across the multidisciplinary team. This input would vary according to each client's needs and it wouldn't necessarily be daily or weekly therapy but perhaps a monthly home visit. The ALS onset unknown group would probably be explained by clients presenting to the clinic late in their disease progression and onset was difficult to diagnose at that point. Therefore, being at a later stage in the disease progression, their needs were higher and they were more likely to require more input from the full multidisciplinary team and have more urgent follow-up required for equipment, education, assessments and frequent ongoing monitoring and symptom management. The lumbar and respiratory ALS phenotype groups were also followed closely with high therapy needs. This graph compares the average face-to-face -face therapy for clients who were funded under the NDIS versus non-NDIS models. And the clients funded by NDIS received more therapy time on average than clients under the non-NDIS model, 
including more home visits. However, they receive less centre-based therapy. We propose that the clients funded by NDIS were generally later in the disease progression, having transitioned from the HAC service across to NDIS. Whereas many of the clients under the non-NDIS model were newer referrals to the clinic and more recently diagnosed. Therefore, their therapy needs were not as high as those who had been involved with the clinic already. The multidisciplinary team were also encouraged to do more face-to-face -face therapy under the NDIS model because other modes of intervention were not consistently billable. However, this represents a more reactive model of care compared to the preventative regular monitoring we can provide through phone calls, liaising with other team members and organisations under the non-NDIS model. With NDIS, we have billable activity, which includes face-to-face -face therapy, some phone calls and emails with clients or carers and NDIS support coordinators, equipment applications and follow-up and report writing, and a minimum of 15 minutes of intervention needs to be um, billed. Non-billable activity includes administration, invoicing, NDIS follow-up, um, client file documentation, and providing urgent intervention during a period of time when a client's uh, NDIS plan doesn't have sufficient funding. Non-billable time recorded an average of almost 28% of total activity when our data was collected. However, the figure was quite underrepresentative um, due to inaccurate recording from clinicians feeling like they needed to be really careful about the way that they showed that they were using their time and being conservative with hours. The range was also quite variable with some NDIS activity climbing to a significant 43% of that activity being non-billable. Joint face-to-face -face therapy time was compared across the same group of people who transitioned from in, uh, HAC to NDIS before and after the rollout. And there was a 5% reduction in joint home visits for um, two or more disciplines going together to a client's home or having them at the center. So we found that uh, with NDIS, there was actually a change in the way that people felt they could have collaborative care between clinicians, and it was reflective in clinicians' perceptions as well of what was going on. So our team has faced some significant challenges working under the new funding stream that is NDIS. Um, some of the challenges that we've encountered include dealing with NDIA representatives, be it delegates, planners, um, local area coordinators who perhaps don't have a particularly good understanding of what a diagnosis of MND means for our patients. Um, we've dealt with um, having limited budgets, um, so um, not enough hours on plans to provide the therapy that is needed and that, as um, Beck mentioned, has um, impacted on the way that we are able to deliver care. Um, there's also been a delay um, for plan reviews, so we find that the NDIS has been set up for um, stable levels of disability or slowly pro progressing levels of disability. So when there is rapid decline in function, increased need for therapy, equipment, etc., we found there's been a huge delay in response from the NDIA. The other challenge that we've faced as a team is the service acti uh, the activity targets that were set by our service, so meeting um, our non-billable and billable ratios, um, and also um, the very big cultural change within the team to shifting within, um, to working within a private um, sort of model of care um, within a public service. Some of the barriers um, that were um, brought up by staff, we um, ended up uh, completing some qualitative data to support the quantitative data that we um, pulled, um, because as um, Beck and Anna mentioned, there were some limitations to the quantitative data that we had. Um, so we surveyed Northern Health staff who are currently working with MND um, clients to gain some insights into how working under the NDIS um, funding model had impacted on the recording of appointments, billing, and their practice. So just to reiterate, under NDIS funding, we're not able to um, bill for all of the time that we can under our non-NDIS models. So any appointment bookings, administrative work without the patient present, all of our um, administration to follow up invoices and billing um, is, is unaccounted for. 
So the moving to the NDIS funding model has required significant cultural change within the team. Um, and a lot of staff members have found it quite confronting having to present invoices for their time to their patients for sign off. Um, staff identified some of the reasons for inaccurate billing or recording of activity as follows. So underbilling, um, likely due to discomfort at asking participants to sign invoices or in an attempt to conserve hours when therapists felt that there were not sufficient hours on a plan. Um, and also completing urgent follow-up therapy where a duty of care was identified. However, therapy hours on an NDIS plan had been exhausted. So 90% of the staff surveyed um, reported that there had been a change in practice um, completing work with MND clients under the NDIS funding model. So some of the themes in the survey responses were a perceived inability to complete collaborative sessions. So those joint therapy sessions that, that we were doing with more than one therapist present have reduced because we would need to double bill for those sessions. So it's perhaps um, more bang for your buck for um, patients with their, with their plans to receive a separate physio session and a separate speech uh, session rather than physio and speech together. Um, and as we've heard today, we all know that collaborative care and multidisciplinary care is really important in reducing the, the burden of appointments for patients. Um, also, there's been an increase in paperwork and an administration for clinicians. Um, there's been difficulty adjusting to providing care under different service models of NDIS and non-NDIS, but trying to ensure a consistent approach to all. Um, and one survey response um, actually identified that their practice had become more reactive than proactive. So rather than regularly following up with patients and perhaps um, doing fortnightly, monthly, however um, regularly phone reviews to touch base and see how things were going, they were waiting for patients to actually contact them to instigate that activity to try to reduce um, using up the, the plan hours. Uh, clinicians also reported that they felt much more pressure to achieve more in an allotted time. So has the way in which we deliver our service changed due to the NDIS rollout? Yes, it has changed. Um, NDIS funded participants, as we saw on some of the previous graphs, are taking more clinician time, but not all of this is clinical time. A lot of that is administration. Might be report writing for applications, and certainly we've seen a huge amount of unfunded hours, particularly from our OTs and speeches in trying to get equipment applications through. We're completing reduced joint sessions, and we know that that is not in best practice. Um, clinicians are reporting reduced job satisfaction, increased administration time, and it's been a difficult transition um, to uh, the private market. So for those of you out there who are about to have NDIS roll out in your area, or perhaps your service is considering providing care under the NDIS funding model, Perhaps there are some considerations um, to think about that and hopefully you can learn from our experience. Um, first of all, I would say cultural change is huge and the key to successful change is adequate preparation. So consider how your service is currently delivered and what changes are anticipated and how to ensure the staff within your service are educated and aware. And we've certainly seen an increase in our ratios of billable to non-billable time um, with further education delivered to our staff. You need to have systems that, um, so you can have a practical way of monitoring your participants' plans. So um, when they're due for review, when they may be expiring, and also what funds are remaining, so we can proactively be planning, flagging with the NDI to say, this person's gonna need a little bit more on their, on their plan. Um, at Northern Health, we're in the process of upgrading our information technology systems um, in order to allow for more automated tracking. Um, the creation of templates and performe that will allow clinicians to be effective and efficient, as well as to meet NDIA quality assurance um, criteria. So for instance, service agreements, referral and intake forms, charge authorization forms, and templates to support planning and advocacy work are really important. Um, and allow clinicians to be clinicians. So ensure that you have sufficient administrative support so that valuable clinician time isn't being wasted. At Northern Health, we've also invested in some technology, um, Surface Pad Pros, nothing too fancy, um, so that staff can take these out on home visits um, and be doing some of their follow-up and administrative work um, on, the, on the road. 
Um, be proactive in um, preparing for plan reviews. So we get a lot of requests from support coordinators for nine month um, reports on how a patient is progressing with their goals. Um, so if you have some um, processes in place where that um, progress can be tracked, um, then it's less of a panic when you get a phone call from a support coordinator asking for um, some information on a very short time frame. Um, all staff need to be registered with a professional body or their professional body in order to be able to bill through NDIS as well. Um, we've found in Victoria that certainly the um, equipment bundle, um, so the equipment library that we can access through MN MND Victoria has been hugely helpful and has saved people a lot of money. So um, patients who opted not to pay, I think it's about the, uh, or have uh, I think it's about the $7,000 um, budget allocated to equipment so that they can um, hire and return um, equipment and um, you know, get different equipment as their needs change, um, save them thousands and thousands of dollars. So that's been a really helpful service. Um, we've also found that support coordination through or shared with um, the MND Association has led to more comprehensive plans being provided. So that's a real, um, thumbs up to the advocacy work um, that our association has been doing. Um, so lastly, um, I think we should, we need, really need to think about how can we advocate for NDIS to be a better system um, for our MND population. Um, we would love to partner with the NDIA to um, perhaps think about funding us to complete further data collection, benchmarking across different services and research to be able to better predict what kind of plan someone um, who's diagnosed with MND is likely to require. So obviously there's always going to be individual variation between people, um, but perhaps we can be using more data such as the phenotype, onset of symptoms, ALS, FRS scores and staging to help us um, more accurately predict what sort of intervention participants will require and this could lead to more efficient planning in the future, streamlined application processes so there's not this back and forth between clinicians and the, the NDIA saying this is what we need, can you do it with less, no we can't, etc. Um, so I wish you all the best for working with the NDIA. <laughs> Thank you very much. We don't have time for questions, but thank you, Anna, Catherine, and Rebecca. That was a great presentation. As many of you will know, um, MND Australia, in partnership with our members, the six state MND associations, have been advocating with the NDIS for nearly 10 years now um, to try and ensure the best outcome for people with MND. And the impact on allied health has been one of our major concerns. So it's really great to hear that presentation of a, a multidisciplinary team that's having a look at that impact. And uh, hopefully we can all learn from that. So next speaker, um, I'd like to introduce to you Christina Dodds, who is the Education and Carer Support Coordinate, Coordinator with Motor Neuron Disease Association of New South Wales. Christina is the education and care, uh, is, um, has been in that role for eight years. She has a master's in adult education and a background in disability, cancer care support, and community development. And Christina is going to talk to us today about supporting NDIS participants living with MND and integrated approach. Welcome, Christina. Thank you, Carol. It's good timing, actually. <laughs> it really sort of fit right in. So in this presentation, we'll be getting on planes. We're going to be sailing, looking at large ships. And what does this have to do with the NDIS? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> As we probably all know, the NDIS is a national insurance scheme that aims to provide people aged under 65 who have a permanent and significant disability with the reasonable and necessary supports they need to live an ordinary life. The rollout of the NDIS has been likened to a half-built plane taking off. It's up and flying, but it isn't merely finished. Much of the fuselage is missing and modifications are being made in flight. People aged under 65 years with disabilities had to get on board. So too did, people, so too did MND New South Wales. We had to get involved. The NDIS offered the promise of improving outcomes for people with MND by providing an individual with funding to assist them access supports for them to live an ordinary life. 
We have been engaged with the NDIS for the last five years since the Hunter Area Trial in 2013. Now the NDIS has rolled out to all of New South Wales and the ACT. It has affected disability service access, funding and delivery for all people aged 65 with MND, under 65. Our vision during this time has been clear. It focuses on the needs of people living with MND. People living with MND need a rapid response to service provision from a range of providers with an understanding of MND, timely access to assistive technology, ongoing service coordination and regular review. But even though the NDIS feels like a half-built plane up in the air, it does take it a while to turn, a little like a very big ship, not really timely or rapidly responsive. With the entry of the NDIS, state funding was withdrawn from community case management services and many other services, and grants were no longer av available for our equipment loan pools PlexiQuip. People aged under 65 years with MND need to negotiate their individualised plan with an NDIS planner, identifying the supports that they may need. And once they have a plan, they will need to find providers and enter service agreements. They need to manage billing while also facing increasing disability. Supports not included in the plan are not funded and the plan cycle repeats every six or 12 months. We were on the NDIS plane with others from the sector while also supporting our members who were taking their seats. So during the past five years, we've changed the way that we deliver services. Also to build capacity, we have introduced new information and educational resources. And we continue to engage with our members, staff, service providers and the NDIS to identify schemes, service and funding gaps and issues for people with MND. But today I am particularly focusing on capacity building, but we'll first um, briefly speak about service delivery changes at MND New South Wales. So pre-NDIS, our support service included the MND information line and publications, the MND advisor service, education and training and assistive technology provision through FlexiQuip, the MND New South Wales equipment service. Our existing MND New South Wales FlexiQuip service became an NDIS service provider in New South Wales and ACT. And this was necessary as state funding was no longer available and we still needed to provide equipment for people under 65. For the NDIS participants, FlexiQuip offers an option of an innovative flat rate bundle per annum package, which allows the participant to rent one of any FlexiQuip stocked items as prescribed by their allied health professional without going back to the NDIS each time an item is needed. The bundle fee also covers the cost of delivery and servicing of the items and allows for a rapid response. In 2016, we created new positions for two coordinator of supports, or COS, and one COS team leader. This service has continued to grow so that now in 2018, we have seven COS and a COS team leader. We wanted to ensure people with N MND on the NDIS secured a rapid response to service provision from a range of providers with an understanding of MND, service coordination and regular review. In the meantime, we maintained our existing MND advisor service, which now has eight part-time MND advisors plus the MND advisor team leader. These advisors do much of the pre-planning and explaining about the NDIS for people newly diagnosed with MND who are aged under 65, in addition to working with my aged care for those over 65. This whole organisation growth has required new office locations and space, increased HR management and much, much more, and impacted the whole organisation. Our model in New South Wales may be different to other state MND associations in Australia, as each state association uses a model that best suits the framework in which it is operating. For capacity building, we were using the expertise we established in pre-NDIS years when working with members and with case managers, acute services and community services. Our capacity building has three target groups, people with MND, health and community care professionals, NDIA staff and delegates. It has involved NDIS pre-planning and planning and responsive education sessions. For people with MND, our capacity building has involved the development of the MND New South Wales NDIS pre-planning resource and the involvement of our MND advisors service. 
Our pre-planning resource for participants is a 25-page document or workbook, and people can either write their responses on a printed version or type their responses into a PDF document. It has four sections. Services and supports are received now. Services and supports I need to remain independent in my home and in the community. Managing my NDIS funding, other notes and considerations and provides a framework for that all important NDIS planning meeting. The NDIS goal construct can be difficult for people living with MND. We, need, we include some samples, for example, the sample goal for community access and social participation in the booklet is to continue to be able to access my community and pursue my interests. The MND New South Wales advisor is usually the one introducing the person with MND to the pre-planning resource specifically and the NDIS more generally. The advisor is building the capacity of the person to become an effective advocate for their own needs and goals so that they can get the most appropriate plan. This can involve what to do when they're contacted by the NDIA, support before the planning meeting and the pre-planning resource, guidance about getting written recommendations, planning meet, meeting support and service provider information for the participant and the planner. Even though the MND advisor is involved in pre-planning, this service is not funded by the NDIS plan. The NDIS is not just a huge leap for people with, living with MND, it has been a huge leap for, for service providers as well. Our key strategies for building service provider capacity included locating existing private providers and encouraging new providers, providing education about MND and what makes a good care provider for a client with MND. We thought it would be smooth sailing, <laughs> but our venture has not been without its surprises. Let's start with our first session in 2016. In that year, we developed a new face-to-face -face education program for service providers called Supporting NDIS Participants Living with MND. It was structured with a morning session of two hours and an afternoon session of two hours, with an hour in between sessions to allow for lunch and networking. It was free for the registrants to attend. In the program for caregivers, we covered what is MND, challenges, building capacity and MND New South Wales services. And in the program for allied health, we covered expectations, MND New South Wales services, changing landscape and multidisciplinary care. If the registrants wanted more ed education about MND, they could attend a day-long MND Aware face-to-face -face program or complete the free online MND Aware training modules. As the NDIS rolled out, so did our program. We targeted regions where NDIS had rolled out within the previous six months. We conducted the pilot in 2016 in the Hunter area of New South Wales, which was the first New South Wales rollout area of the NDIS. In 2017, our target areas were Central Coast, Northern Sydney and Southwest Sydney. In 2018, we ran the program in the Illawarra, Central Eastern Sydney and Southern Sydney. The care providers attending included service management, managers, relationship and care coordinators, trainers and others. The allied health participants included OT, speech, physio, social workers and, the, and all the others. Although the care providers rated the pilot session well in 2016, most wanted to build a care provider organisation under the NDIS, but they didn't seem to want to reveal their idea, ideas for models of service. It was quite hard to get discussion and interaction going with this group. By 2018, although the program had remained unchanged, the care providers were rating the sessions as 100% excellent. They were grateful to learn more about MND, often because they had one or two clients with MND who had already accessed their service, and they wanted to know what people with MND value from their care providers. They did not seem so fearful of sharing models of service and realised that there was in fact enough work and 24 hour care work for each of them. The pilot program for Allied Health in 2016 rated very highly. The Hunter area had been a trial site for several years before it became the first rollout site in New South Wales and Allied Health were familiar with the NDIS. Most valued were the interactive group sessions that allowed for constructive discussion and brainstorming, uh, and a short video of people living with MND and case studies. 
the participants found it a valuable networking opportunity that allowed them to discuss ways other clinicians worked as private practitioners with MND clients. For the 2017 sessions, the excellent rating had dropped from 90% to 66. Also, we had one person who was very upset about the whole privatisation of services for people with MND aged under 65. The rollout of the NDIS to these areas had not gone well, and during this time, the NDIS and providers alike were struggling with the release of the new NDIS portal. You may remember the media co coverage of the billing problems at this time and the difficulties providers were experiencing in getting paid via the portal. In our sessions, participants wanted answers to the billing and the other problems that they were having with the NDIA. Our session plan went out the window. We were not the NDIA, so that we, we didn't actually have the answers, but we could and we did share what we had experienced and provided a forum for the practitioners to share their frustrations. Not what we had initially intended, but nevertheless worthwhile. However, our first two sessions for Allied Health in 2018 showed this downward, showed this downward satisfaction trend was not just a once-off, with the excellent rating dropping to around 30%. We had more New South Wales Government community Allied Health staff attending than previously. They didn't know whether they would continue to provide services for people under 65. This, um, yeah, this is kind of what Samantha was saying earlier. We didn't have the answers for that, but we did suggest that teams could become NDIS service providers. One of our participants was an OT employed by New South Wales Health, and she went on to champion the cause for her team, and, how, and now they are registered NDIS providers. But to our knowledge, this is the only team that has done so. The attendees also wanted much more detailed information about NDIS reporting and evidence requirements to substantiate client needs identified during planning. The information we had in the program was too general to meet this information need. So prior to the last session in 2018, we updated the program content to include more detailed information from our experience with NDIS allied health reporting and evidence requirements. The type of content was quite specific. For people with MND, we were finding that a six month plan is best. Coordination of support is recommended at 52 hours for six months as MND is complex. And we were also recommending pre-approved AT budgets. We know that allied health supports uh, need to be the cornerstone of any plan. Hours for the initial assessment and for therapy and review need to be included. These hours are based on a six month plan. Reports and recommendations, including MND clinic reports if attending, are essential for planning meeting, for the planning meeting. Also, it's not uncommon for a person to need around 10 hours of personal care per day, especially if they need a two, two person transfer. Consumables also needed to be included, as well as home maintenance, domestic assistance and meal prep, emergency respite funding, home modifications and more. The new material was first presented at our 2018 session in Southern Sydney and the session rating improved, but we're still considering the content development as a work in progress. In 2018, we continue to build capacity and advocate for people with MND. We have developed fact sheets for LACs and NDIA planners and a webinar training session. Also, NDIA planners have been attending the MND Aware face-to-face -face training offered in our existing education calendar. In the coming months, we will be updating our pre-planning resource and undertaking further content development for our NDIS program. And of course, continue with our direct high-level advocacy with the NDIA. So during our involvement with the NDIS, we've been a little like, little like a yacht. Our course has not been ordered or smooth, but we have been able to adapt to the prevailing winds. We will keep sailing the yacht as the wind and waters change and remain responsive and advocate for the supports people with MND require to live an ordinary life. Thank you.
Thank you, Christina. And we have got time for a couple of questions. You were bang on 15 minutes. So would anybody like to ask Christina any questions? Any hands up anywhere? No questions, so please join me in thanking Christina. Oh, hang on. Oh, hang on. No, go on. Go on. We've got a question. Yeah. Yeah. And I was saying for art, it's just quite a traditional sense of roots that keeps us providing our life help in all these times. That's something really Thank you. That's good to hear. Thank you, Christina, and thank you for sharing Emily New South Wales' um, journey, navigating the introduction of the NDIS and the changing service landscape. Um, I think it really demonstrates um, that we all have to be so responsive to change, and um, it certainly has been quite a roller coaster of a journey so far, and I'm sure there's more to come. So I'd like to now introduce to you our next speaker. Paul Carfarella. Um, Paul is a health psychologist in the Department of Respiratory Medicine at Flinders Medical Centre and is affiliated with Flinders University and the University of Adelaide in South Australia. His areas of expertise include the assessment, treatment and consequences of mental health problems in people with chronic diseases and their carers. Non-pharmacological methods of treatment, including behaviour change programs, illness perceptions, adherence, and social stigma in disabled populations. So Paul is going to talk to us today about supporting well-being in motor neuron disease for patients, carers, social networks, and health professionals, a scoping review and synthesis. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, today I'd just like to report uh, on the review that we completed uh, as a group, and the group involved uh, these people here, apart from myself. Uh, we would also like to acknowledge uh, funding by the uh, Thomas Motor Neurone Research Project and thank the people on that list there for helping us out with that. So why did we carry this out? Well, first of all, as you all know, there are both physical and psychological problems to manage in motor neurone disease. There are clinical guidelines and reviews around, mainly directed at the management of physical symptoms, although there is a change in the literature in recent times. We also know that pharmacotherapy is heavily used in this population, but it's uh, virtually untested in terms of the outcome studies. And we know that intervention studies are needed as a basis for any sort of psychosocial treatments. And we know that the impacts go well beyond the patient. Uh, as Samar mentioned this morning, and those of you familiar with the area know that there are major psychological impacts for the carers, whether that's depression, anxiety, burden, et cetera. We also know that there's a, a big impact and that can be reciprocal with the patient on those in the social network, and that as health professionals, it also has an impact on us, and that can also, apart from uh, undermining our own self-care, it can undermine the way that we carry out our job as well. So our aims in doing this were to review the wellbeing research in motor neurone disease across the social and support network, and that included both uh, the person, the carer, and other members of their social networks, as well as their healthcare providers. So we wanted to describe where we're at with it, identify any gaps in relation to improving wellbeing, and also potentially point to more comprehensive and integrated ways that we can support across that um, social network. So what we did was a systematic search. Uh, so we did a review of the reviews, if you like. Um, so we had a look at the recent high quality reviews to um, encompass a broader picture of what's actually happening. And so the synthesis uh, um, approach that we used involved uh, getting some summary statements from the different papers, which included the results, conclusions, and the practice implications. If we didn't get enough information from that, then we obviously looked a little bit more deeply. 
When we went through the reviews, uh, as you can see from the areas that are highlighted there on that table, you can see that around about 41% of these were observational, uh, descriptive types of studies involved with you know, where patients were at and what the impact uh, is on them. In terms of the interventions, however, for patients, that was only 7% of the literature. When we were looking at carers, uh, about 19% of the literature was looking at the impact on them. In terms of uh, intervention studies, that was only 2% of the literature. Uh, when we're looking at the wider social network, uh, again, 2% of the literature, and the impact on us as health professionals and our role and so on, uh, that was really small, uh, 1%. So what did we actually find? Uh, when we looked at patient well-being, and we considered um, what was very well known, um, depression, anxiety, poor quality of life, et cetera, as we know that's really prevalent, but it's also worth recognising that it's not just about their physical status and where they're at there, but it's also about um, suffering, social support and hopelessness. And in fact, these uh, relationships are pretty strong. So even though we know that, uh, we lack guidelines, we lack research in order to be able to alleviate psychological problems. And so the reviews have recommended several potential bases uh, for interventions and I'll talk about those shortly. So when we're considering the psychotherapeutic and the social support interventions, um, there are a number of cross-sectional studies as I mentioned. And even though there's lots and lots of psychological associations that have been noted, the actual progress in translating these into intervention research hasn't um, been as, as quick, uh, hasn't been anywhere near as prevalent. There are sometimes functional reasons for that in terms of uh, uh, ethics committees and um, funding and so on, um, but there has been a, a little bit of a hold up in that area. The literature is changing, however. There has been a recent trend so even though we mentioned that 7 and 2% for patients and carers respectively, um, most of those have happened in the last few years. So there is a trend of growth in that area. Uh, I mentioned before there's no evidence relating to pharmacotherapy interventions, even though it's extremely common. Um, that was one systematic review. And there are a number of psychotherapy interventions uh, that are out there, and we've heard about a few of them today, such as dignity therapy, narrative therapy, and so on. Um, and the reason that these haven't necessarily made it into guidelines and recommendations from that have been generally due to the quality of the studies that have been done in these areas uh, and the high bias that occurs in the literature. So the proposition has been that we start to explore and you've heard today some of the exploratory studies that have been done over the last few years. For example, uh, Samar this, mor this morning mentioned some of her work. Um, and then from there, we're looking uh, to move uh, the field on a bit into case control, cohort, and then clinical trial designs. When we looked at the review findings in terms of advanced care planning and other decision, uh, decision support interventions, when we looked at patient perspectives on this, um, most of the studies were limited to uh, end of life period. And those of you who attended Samar's talk this morning, uh, you'll see that um, this is still the case, even from her recent work, where it tends to be down to the last three months in Western Australia. So this is a common problem right across the field. Obviously, we're looking at trying to do that a little bit earlier or much earlier in the process. Uh, and that is the preference that is noted amongst the reviews, and this has been going on for a few years now, but still we have problems in this area. So the call for research is to support better design and timing. So if we want that to occur, we obviously need to publish that sort of thing so that we can then have more political influence uh, by getting things into guidelines. When we're looking at our patient-centered delivery of the health services, the reviews found uh, that well-being was influenced by how effectively health services respond to patient needs. So if we don't consider patient needs carefully, we're pretty much stuffed before we begin in terms of trying to get a good outcome. Um, only one of the identified reviews actually examined healthcare from the patient perspective. 
And what we found from this was that they expected to have some dignified health care, um, but they were left with unmet um, expectations. So uh, starting point for this uh, is qualitative work, and you would have heard some of that qualitative work underway from the results you've heard today. Quality of life um, isn't just based on where they're at physically. We often make a lot of assumptions on where they're based physically, um, but it's actually more connected with where they're at psychologically. Um, and so we need to integrate that with our physical care. When we're looking at the care of wellbeing, uh, the results of the reviews indicated what we know, and that is that their wellbeing is really, really heavily compromised. There are high rates of problems in this population. And even though we know this because there are a lot of studies in this area, in terms of what we actually do about that, this is an underdeveloped area. Uh, so some of the suggestions from the reviews that have been done include direct practical assistance, uh, psychosocial interventions, and this should be at uh, targeted predictable points in the timeline, and also looking at the carers who are most in need. And another finding that has been consistent from the reviews is that uh, sometimes not only do we begin too late with support for carers, but it tends to finish too early and it should continue well after um, the, the death of the patient. When looking at care of wellbeing and considering home help and respite care, uh, some of the needs that were identified from the reviews uh, were that they have respite care, which is pretty obvious to us all, uh, direct help with home care and household tasks, financial assistance, and then practical training and support help with nursing skills and equipment. And so at this uh, conference, you've heard a lot about different forms of equipment that can be really, really helpful to enhance the quality of life of patients and carers. Um, but obviously some training might be required there. And so the earlier we do that, the better. And so this needs to be supported uh, because clearly we're trying to do all of this learning in the face of some pretty serious psychological and physical problems. There are other practical supports that were noted by the reviews as well. So much of the distress that comes from caring uh, stems from the time consuming nature and the changing technical requirements. The requirements change as the disease progresses and there are different technical requirements for the carers to carry out their tasks uh, um, accompanied with each of those stages. There are worries about the caring responsibilities and if they're doing a good job. Uh, factors like guilt and concern about uh, their own self-efficacy are pretty common. And there's an incompatibility with uh, trying to care and then trying to also look after yourself. And if you're not looking after yourself, it makes it quite difficult to carry out the, the caring role. But sometimes looking after yourself might mean leaving the house, which is not always possible. So interventions uh, to help carers to socially connect uh, and to mobilise some of their informal networks and community support and to have all this coordinated is suggested from the reviews. Uh, for the carers, in terms of some psychological and psychoeducational interventions, uh, the suggestions from the reviews have been that as the issues are across many disease stages, then we face different types of problems. So for example, once intimacy stops occurring, uh, once communication verbally stops occurring and so on, at these different uh, phases, there are different uh, types of psychological issues that are confronted not only by the patient, but by the carer as well. Uh, and so it's important to target these particular times and have input at these different stages. So this means uh, along the way that we have to modify our approach, not only to where the patient is at, but also to where the carer is at. Um, so counselling inter interventions have also been recommended. Tailoring bereavement support programs, and the key word there is tailoring rather than a one size fits all. So there are many suggested interventions and some work has gone in terms of developing some of these but many of these interventions still have a long way to go in terms of testing. 
So the re review findings were that we generally need to deliver these interventions much earlier in the tra trajectory. Um, we also know that carers are in much better shape generally earlier in the trajectory. Uh, later on, as uh, there are more neurobehavioral types of problems, cognitive problems and so on, we know that the burden increases markedly on the carers themselves. They also tend to have a little bit more free time, yeah, if they ever get free time earlier in the process compared to later on. Um, and, and we can target high need carer groups, you know, in terms of what shape they're in and, and some of those who might be struggling in terms of their skills uh, and that might depend on their background and their own psychological issues as well. So we need a well-founded approach which takes into consideration what their specific needs are. We had an example of that this morning with Samar's work uh, where she was using the uh, CSNAT to um, try and get a, a fairly clear idea of what the carer's needs might be and therefore constructing an intervention on the basis of that. There are also deficiencies in our health services, which I'm sure you're all acutely aware of, which impact care and wellbeing overall. It's been suggested by a number of reviews that a designated coordinator can be really helpful with this, and potentially this might well be the case. But what we really need is research to support this strategy. Potentially it could be a good strategy, we just don't have enough evidence yet to convince uh, the key people who might provide us with the funding to do this. Uh, um, plenty of research is now starting to suggest that carers should be far more involved in um, identifying what is required. And uh, we know about skill deficits in health professionals. If you were listening this morning and you read some of the quotes from uh, Samar's talk, you would have heard one of the quotes was uh, from a neurologist who said that um, well, we don't believe that empathy is something that can be taught. Um, what do you think of that? Uh, <laughs> Um, unless that person has a fairly severe psychotic disorder or um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, pretty severe on the autism spectrum, of course it can be taught, so it's just not good enough to have that approach. Um, so that's one thing that we need to consider. Um, and uh, associated with this is also uh, these issues at the different stages, diagnosis and further down the track. Um, and so staff need training. Uh, we mentioned multidisciplinary clinics beforehand, so there is some evidence that this can be helpful, but how are we going to carry this out? There are lots of different models of multidisciplinary clinics, so the reviews suggest further testing in this area, uh, as well as the education. Uh, with advanced care planning, uh, there are a number of benefits associated with this, uh, which are all pretty obvious to us all. However, um, there's a small evidence base in our specific population about the best way to implement this. And so again, we encourage people to continue to test this sort of thing, to try and find the best way of getting an appropriate model for this. Because as you know, the guidelines talk about, oh, we should be implementing this early on, et cetera. But we also know that this is a huge problem in our field and that, do that doesn't tend to happen. So we know uh, from the reviews uh, that we need to also be considering things like cost effectiveness, as our uh, bosses always remind us of efficiencies. Uh, but we know that if we can actually get some interventions that are helpful, that the benefit doesn't just remain limited to the patient, it also um, crosses over to the carers. Um, and so trying to get this in a timely way is, is a really key factor for us. So some of the suggested psychotherapies, uh, we mentioned uh, a couple this morning, um, the social workers um, uh, presented a, a nice um, overview of dignity therapy and narrative therapy. These are amongst a number of different types of therapies that require more testing. This is not to say that those things don't work brilliantly, but we just need these things to be published so that we can get them into um, a form such as guidelines where they've been tested and true and we can convince people providing funding that they can be helpful. So some other gaps, uh, these are in the social and support networks. We know that apart from the carer, there's a lot of us that have strong relationships with people with MND. These might be other family members, these might be friends and so on. 
These people are part of the support network. These people have a significant role to play for the patients and these people can be significantly psychologically affected. So we need to um, take care of these people as well and also train them up if they're having a significant role because we know about the so social contagion effects. Um, and we also know that this is important because um, patients and carers tend to reach out to, this, to these people first rather than necessarily going to psychologists. Um, and so that whole concept that you heard about earlier today about the Compassionate Communities Network is something that we could really support. And then the health professionals. We are totally ignored in the literature except for one study. <laughs> so, um, or, well two actually with the new one. But um, there's not a lot in terms of the impact on us. And we're not robots. Uh, there is an impact on us. There needs to be more work done in this field about ways that we can support ourselves and ways that our organisations can support us to uh, make sure that we are in the best shape so that we can provide the best possible care to our patients, their carers and their support networks. So some suggestions finally from the reviews in terms of improving the quality of research towards effective interventions. Uh, there are a number of methodological toolkits that have been suggested. Uh, staged intervention design has been suggested. Uh, we know about asking patients and families about what's important to them rather than assuming that a one size fits all. And then we need to design and test these things. So just in the final slide now, just concluding that uh, there have been many descriptive studies. We don't need a lot more descriptive studies. We now need some movement towards the interventions. It's pretty clear to us what the issues are. It's important that we ask the patients, carers, and the rest of the social support network and health professionals for their views in this as well. And then we need to not only continue to develop interventions, but test them in a manner where they are done well enough that they can be published so that then they have more chance of getting into guidelines so that we can then um, continue to get some funding to support the people in, most in need. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, that's great. Thank you very much. No time for questions, I'm afraid, but I'm sure people can catch up with you in the break if they want to ask any more. And we thank you for your call to action um, for highlighting the importance of interventions to improve well-being for people living with MND and their carers and the vital need for more research in that area. So thank you, Paul. So our final speaker for this session is um, Rod Harris. Rod is the CEO of MND Victoria and has been a significant influence in ensuring the rights of people living with MND are assured in legislation and service delivery. He has been heavily involved in palliative care and its engagement with people living with MND for many years. And he's going to talk to us today about influencing and voluntary assisted dying. Welcome, Rod. We see as need help with the basics in life. Moving slides forward is one of them. Uh, thank you, I'm sorry that I'm the last presenter before uh, afternoon tea. I'm sure you're all feeling a bit fatigued. We've heard some lovely material this afternoon. One of the things I'd like to encourage any CEO or manager here is to look after your staff. Uh, voluntary assisted dying, euthanasia, dying with dignity. Doesn't really matter how it's labelled. It's been an issue confronting governments and communities for many years. It's one of the more polarising issues in our community, one that's fought mostly at the extremes with passion and persuasion. Yet 10 opinion polls in Australia conducted between 2007 and 2016 seem to provide evidence that the Australian public was supportive of legislation that would provide voluntary assisted dying. I'm not the first to say that polls are polls. And one of the key problems with polls is what question is asked of whom. But I use this list to demonstrate that there is interest and probable support for this legislation. What I want to do today is uh, present a short history of voluntary assisted dying legislation, a brief overview of MND Victoria's position, 
and the power of effective advocacy to ensure that if a bill becomes law, that people with MND are not discriminated against in either using voluntary assisted dying or being protected from it. And I'll, I'll probably slot between VAD or voluntary assisted dying, um, one of my problems. Um, what I won't do is argue for or against voluntary assisted dying. Um, the international experience has been largely driven by Europe and the USA, and we've all heard of Dignitas in Switzerland and of Belgium and the Netherlands. In the USA, their Supreme Court decided that voluntary assisted dying was a state issue, and so the experience there is a state-by-state -state process, which is something akin to what's happening in Australia. In Australia, the first legalised uh, voluntary assisted dying was in the Northern Territory, and that was voided by the Commonwealth in their wisdom in 1997. Tasmania came close and lost a vote by, in the House of Assembly by 13 to 12. In 2016, South Australian House of Assembly rejected a private member's bill to legalise a right to request voluntary euthanasia in circumstances where a person is in unbearable pain and suffering from a terminal illness. On 20th of September 2017, the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill 2017 was introduced into the Victorian Parliament and passed into legislation on the 29th of November. It will come into effect on the 16th of June 2019. The next day, on 21 September, a Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill failed in the New South Wales Parliament. Uh, that bill was modelled on the Oregon Death with Dignity Act um, and uh, considered a significant number of sub submissions and contained a raft of safeguards, according to the commentators, um, but it failed. And just this week, uh, the Parliament in Western Australia, a parliamentary committee assigned to look at uh, voluntary assisted dying, handed down a 600-page report recommending that that state introduce legislation on voluntary assisted dying. MD Victoria neither supports nor opposes voluntary assisted dying. We have adopted a position of studied neutrality. It does, however, have a policy and promotes a policy that MD Victoria supports patients' rights in all things that are lawful. MD Victoria is a broad church. It, it represents people living with MD Victoria, it provides services and supports, and it attempts to influence policy and practices that restrict access to rights that are created. A good example of our influencing is our work to ensure that people living with MND are not discriminated against under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. For example, people with MND in Victoria, and I'm sure in other states, were being contacted by phone. If they didn't answer or respond to three calls, they were struck off. Forget the fact that perhaps people with MND couldn't answer a phone or couldn't speak if they did lift up the phone. Another was that telephone interviews were undertaken, resulting in assistive technology being totally ignored in their care needs. Uh, with MND Australia and MND New South Wales and the support of the other MND associations in Australia, we're overcoming both of those activities and others that discriminate against people with MND. MND Victoria is a broad church and it has clients and members with a wide range of views and beliefs on many issues especially the ones that confront us all. Collingwood or Port Melbourne? <laughs> Queensland Reds or New South Wales Blues? Like, these are important things. And people have different views about them. It's really unfair, in my view, and inappropriate for a service organisation working with a whole population, funded mainly by donations, fundraising and government that comes from a whole group of other people with different views, to actually hang our hat on support or oppose. And so it is with voluntary assisted dying. We neither support nor oppose, but we will fight for patients' rights in all things that are lawful. The legislative process in Victoria has been lengthy and it commenced with an assisted dying framework which was prepared by a committee of parliament and that was informed by over a thousand submissions and numerous hearings. The Ministerial Advisory Panel, chaired by Professor Brian Owler, uh, was created to advise government on 
how a compassionate and safe legislative framework for voluntary assisted dying could be implemented, including implementation in Victoria to provide access to eligible people while minimising risk to potentially vulnerable people. The panel re released a discussion paper, 176 submissions were made, 14 forums, roundtable discussions, more than 300 stakeholders, it was everywhere. An interim report summarised the consultation process in April 2017 and a final report in July. And if I can recommend reading anything, the executive summary of the final report is a good read. It really demonstrates uh, how a process worked to uh, bring together what the government was looking for. And if you want to be put to sleep, read the full report. The bill was introduced into Parliament on the 20th of September and passed on 19 November and, as I said before, comes into effect on the 16th of June. In addressing voluntary assisted dying and advocacy, I've, I've pulled out the, the key headings of the final report. And the final report grouped issues um, into eligibility, request an assessment and completing the process. So eligibility. The discussion paper canvassed a range of issues regarding eligibility. And the criteria include a requirement that a person must have decision-making capacity in relation to voluntary assisted dying. As we're all aware, MD has a relatively common element of frontal lobe dementia, affecting executive function and decision-making. Some 50% of people exhibit this. Some people would probably think that 50% of the population exhibit it as well, particularly 100% in the Australian Parliament at the moment. <laughs> While there was significant discussion about psychological and psychiatric assessment to, de to determine capacity or to determine whether capacity was affected by depression, there was no recognition of the loss of executive function that might affect decision-making capacity. With the focus on psychiatric and psychological assessment, we argued for people with frontal lobe involvement in their disease to be assessed by a neuropsychologist, experienced in the disease, like motor neuron disease, and many others, and they should determine the capacity of people with frontal lobe involvement to make decisions about voluntary assisted dying. This was accepted with the recommendation that a referral must be made to an appropriate specialist for assessment. A small but crucial change for people with MND. In terms of request and assessment, the request process must be initiated by the individual and made three times. A first request, followed by a written declaration of enduring request, and then a final request. The first and third requests can be spoken, while the, third, the second request must be in writing and signed. As we all know, the ability to speak can be one of the first impacts of MND. Speech can be failing, become un unintelligible to outsiders, but remain understandable to family and very close friends. We argued that alternative communication would be a way to, to address the loss of speech due to MND including interpretation by a family member, carer or other person. We also proposed that the first and third requests could be made by asking the question and an indication of agreement or disagreement with the question by the person should be accepted as requests. Similarly, we argued that speech generating devices such as eye gaze and synthesised speech or an e-tran board could also be constitute making the first and third requests. The panel agreed that interpreters, and they've, they've used that word, I think, quite carefully. They've used the word interpreters to mean not only alternative communication, but other language and other communication forms. They agreed that interpreters could be used in making the first, third requests, and they specifically mentioned technology. The second request must be in writing, signed and witnessed. Again, we know that MND attacks the fine motor skills required for writing and signing, reaching a point where neither is possible. We argued that a written document could be produced for the person and in front of witnesses, signed or a mark made in indicating signature of the document. 
For those who had no ability to hold or move a pen or make a mark of any kind, we argued that signing could be confirmed by asking a question such as, do you want this document to be considered as signed by you? Pretty simple. Witnesses could certify that the person indicated their wish that the document be considered as signed by them. The panel agreed that alternatives to writing and signing a document would be acceptable as long as they address the other elements of making a request. And I suppose that's one of the things that we've been really focused on with our advocacy about uh, voluntary assisted dying. So we don't want special consideration, we don't want different consideration, we just don't want to be discriminated against. So then we get to completing the process, and what an interesting heading to use uh, for voluntary assisted dying. I still shake my head over it. Um, the discussion paper proposed that the person using voluntary assisted dying should self-administer the pres prescribed medication. MND commonly affects swallowing and peg feeding is considered one of the key interventions to extend life expectancy. As noted above, it also affects the uh, fine motor skills and creates problems with self-feeding and hence taking a pill. We argued that if a person was otherwise eligible to participate in voluntary assisted dying, they shouldn't be discriminated against simply because they're unable to take a medication from its locked container and swallow it. We highlighted that while self-administration was a protection in the proposed legislation, people who were so physically disabled that they could not self-administer, yet still wanted to use the right created by the legislation to end their lives, should have assistance in taking the medication. We propose that people who were so physically disabled to not be able to self-administer should have the right to have someone administer the medication and that the medication could be and should be in different forms to facilitate self-administration or administration by another person. The panel agreed with that approach and made provision for the coordinating medical practitioner to administer the medication. And also the process at the moment where they're trying to identify the medications, they're looking for medications that come in different forms, liquid for injection, for example. So what have we learned? I think we've learned that organisations have to consider the views of their members. Our members so are people with a variety of views and opinions. That broad church that John Howard unfortunately used to describe the Australian population. Our positions must reflect that community of interest that we have. And our focus is on all people with MND, not those that support or oppose or Catholic or Brindle or Port or Collingwood. Advocacy really has to be about the rights that are created in legislation and making sure that those rights or those entitlements don't discriminate and are protected. I think when we advocate, we also need to be able to provide solutions. And I think that's been one of the terrific things that MND Australia and the MND associations have done in advocacy with the NDIS, is we've not just bitched about problems, but we've argued with solutions, and that makes a difference. And we have to keep our membership informed. So I hope what I've outlined is the importance of advocacy, not just in voluntary assisted dying, but in any issues that take away or give rights to people, particularly people with MND. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to respond to any questions if there's time. Too efficient. I was up in time. <laughs> Thank you, Rod. And we do have time for questions because you are bang on your 15 minutes. So, any questions for Rod? Excellent. <laughs> we got a microphone up the back. Thank you, Ms. Gina. Hi, Rod. Thanks for that. I, I, I think it's something that's been on our mind about how. We go about working as, as these things change, and Victoria, of course, is going to have that first. Have you thought at all about how it's going to change the way we work um, with people? Uh, I have, and 
it doesn't change the way we work with people because I think MND associations and I think all of us in our organisations are actually person-centred and that we'll support a person through the decisions that they make about their disease. And, uh, okay, voluntary assisted dying is a very significant decision to be made. But family and friends still need to be supported and we, I, I can see us playing a role in doing that. Um, obviously, we don't have any role in um, prescription of, of drugs and uh, there's, it's contrary to the legislation to advocate for or against by the medical profession and I think we should adopt that as well. We should not be advocating for or against. We should make people aware of their rights under that legislation and the protections that they have and that's our role. Our role is in an informing role and then a supporting role. But uh, look, I, I, I've done a lot of reading about this and uh, looked at the examples in, uh, in Europe and America and the numbers are small. It is people that have conviction about wanting to end their lives. This is a very uh, protected mechanism. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't actually see there being a swathe of deaths because of voluntary assisted dying anywhere in Australia if this legislation comes in. But it is a right that's been created in Victoria. And uh, our view is in Victoria that we support patients' rights in all things that are lawful. <laughs> We're looking at you. Mark, great. Right. Um, thank you for doing that a difficult topic in a very, very measured and sensitive way. Um, that was, uh, and, and, and I'm not sure if I'm making a comment or making a question here, but there will be a, um, there will be a time for carers to, I'm not sure when it is, when that topic is introduced. And it's a big issue that obviously is something that you said you need to be not advocating for or against and that has to be totally you know, agnostic or neutral but there will be a time when that needs so people are aware and informed and whether that's through their family and the family might bring that up first before the person itself but so I'm not quite sure when that is and everybody's got a different <coughs> journey and a different time scale. Um, so I don't, I'm, I'm not really asking when that might be because I don't know. My question is, is that it's probably highly likely that whilst legislation will be introduced in other states at different times, it's been knocked back in other places, WA's got it on its, uh, on its list to be looked at, do you have any thought about whether there'd be some form of migration of MND sufferers from other states who would want to come to Victoria? Mm. Uh, the legislation prescribes that uh, people have to be resident in Victoria for a minimum of 12 months. Um, and that has to be evidenced and so, I, I, look, I would imagine there might be, uh, same as there are people travelling from Australia to uh, Switzerland to use the services of Dignitas. Um, the 12 months was seen as, uh, I understand by the Parliament, as, as a reasonable period of residential entitlement. One last question, Mr. Pearson. Thank you, Ron. I, I agree with you that if we uh, were to go down this path, that it's been done in, in a very well considered way in Victoria. And I think a lot of the organisations, like yourself, like the College of Physicians, in fact, as well, um, have put their minds uh, very well in a very dignified and you know, so a lot of discretion in the way they've approached this and not inflaming the, the situation. Um, and I also agree with you that all of us need to work within the legislation um, and to continue to support our patients and families as we've always done. And I say that speaking for the Catholic Hospital, um, no matter what our own personal views might be. One of the problems I have always had, however, with the legislation is the fact that it's very cherry picking in who it enables and all the other people who don't get a go at this. Um, and we, 
we assume that our legislators make laws for all of us that are fair and, and as equitable as possible. This seems a very inequitable law. So if you were CEO of Huntington's Victoria, what would you defend most of all? Um, I, I, I suppose that this is an issue that individuals and organisations have to take their own counsel and, and make decisions according to uh, um, how they see themselves. Having you know, experienced cancer three years ago, if this legislation had been available with the sort of results that I was looking at, um, I might have considered it. But right now, I have no view one way or the other. Um, I see that the fact that there is a right that people can exercise is important, um, but it's up to each individual. And I think the, the a, a committee that I'm working on at the moment is uh, producing a range of information based on a, a three-tier uh, uh, system of um, information that will give people an overview, information that will address people who are considering use of the legislation, and at the third level, information that is about what you have to do. And I think our role will always be to point people in the direction of the information to allow individuals to make their own decisions. Within the health system, I think every health provider has a duty to continue to provide the support and services that they would always provide. Um, and uh, there will be institutions that choose not to be a part of this, and so be it. The, I think the one good thing about this legislation is that people and institutions have that right. Um, so I wouldn't be advising anybody of much. What I would be saying to people is, inform yourself. I, I came to a meeting here with uh, Palliative Care Australia last year that had a panel of seven people discussing the Victorian draft legislation. Of the people on the panel, only one had actually read, from what I could understand of what they were asking, actually read the document that had been prepared. And the only, the one that had was Brian Aller, who was chair of that committee. And I, I think it's really important that, that before we launch into the fears that this legislation's gonna result in people dropping dead right, left and centre because of voluntary assisted dying all over the state, is we actually understand what the legislation's about and understand where it's come from. And whether it's in Victoria or Western Australia or wherever, uh, we've all got to learn about that sort of stuff. And I think the information that this committee that I'm working on will help that happen. And I think that will be a calming influence, I hope, of, of any of the hype that's out there. Yeah, and, and I, I agree entirely. I suppose that the, the thrust of my question was that one of the things that people fear the most in life is becoming demented and losing capacity, and this legislation does nothing for that for you. Yep. Um, and will remain inequitable in that area. I agree totally. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod, um, for introducing. <laughs> it's going to be a conversation that will be ongoing, I think, for many months and years to come in Australia, so thank you, Rod. Um, so that brings this session to a close, and we now have afternoon tea. Um, if the speakers for the final session could meet Joe up here at the front about five past three, and we'll reconvene at ten past three. Thank you very much. <laughs>